civil procedure, we talked about how to resolve civil debates without a trial. So this episode is all about how to, well, resolution without trial. And there's three main ways to do that. First, you can settle. Second, you can dismiss. And third, you can have judgments. So we'll go ahead and talk about all these things. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention is even though we've talked about pleadings and we've talked about discovery, and this is kind of our transition into uh, trial, actually talking about how the trial functions and the procedures there, this is going to be a little bit different in some of these things will have already previously been talked about in the other stages of the litigation uh, process. Uh, specifically, you can settle at any time. Dismissals, you have Rule 12 where you dismiss at the pleading stage. Uh, rule 41 is also different. That's at the pleading stage as well. And then the judgments that we'll be talking about, there's three main kinds. There's default judgment, summary judgment, and judgment as a matter of law. And this third judgment that we'll be talking about in a different episode. This is going to be uh, something that happens during trial. We'll go ahead and introduce it uh, here just because it is a way to resolve an issue without trial, but it is a procedure that happens during trial. And so that's kind of going to be the outline for this episode. Uh, summary judgment is going to be a long discussion. Uh, it's still in this episode, but it's got a lot behind it. And so uh, we'll spend probably about half our time talking about settlement, dismissals, and then default judgment. But then the remainder of our time will be about summary judgment. So settlement. Well, over 95% of cases never make it to trial. Why is that? They settle. Uh, and settlement is just you agree to pay the other party a certain amount of money and to drop the case. Or I owe you this much, right, and we won't go through with taking this to the jury. And so that settlement is pretty straightforward. Uh, most of the time, cases are going to settle, and everybody is going to win. Sorry, at least one party is going to win a settlement. Uh, there is a winner. One person's going to get more money than the other person. The other person isn't going to get anything at all. And so ultimately, settlement just results in a win for one party. It's not a win-win situation uh, because... Before trial, settlement highly favors uh, the defendant, but after trial, settlement, sorry, before trial, settlement highly favors the plaintiff, but after trial, settlement highly favors the defendant uh, in being more beneficial for the other party. So dismissals. Uh, dismissals co can come from either the plaintiff or the defendant. Most of the time we've been talking about dismissals that come from the defendant, and those are going to be all your Rule, rule 12 dismissals, uh, whether it's for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, and personal jurisdiction, venue, uh, and etc. Uh, specifically in this uh, semester, we've talked about failure to state a claim, and that's going to be Rule 12b-6. Uh, and that's those are dismissals that typically come from the defendant. But the plaintiff can bring a dismissal, too, underneath Rule 41 they can voluntarily dismiss their claims as long as they do so before the defendant answers. So note, this is all done in the pleading stage as far as the dismissals go. Why would a plaintiff want to dismiss them? Well, because, I mean, they're the ones suing. They want this case to be heard. They're probably going to dismiss if they have a hearing with the judge, and it looks like the plaintiff's claim is not going to go in their favor. And if you dismiss underneath Rule 20, uh, 41, you can drop that case and refile in a different court that still meets all the jurisdictional requirements, and you can have that case heard there. So that is a way for the plaintiff to avoid a potentially poor situation for them. And it can be potentially very beneficial for the plaintiff, especially if the statute of limitations is about to run up. Uh, usually, motions to dismiss are going to be court orders without prejudice. And that's going to be you, and that's going to be at least for the first dismissal. And that is where a party is able to refile in a different jurisdiction with the same rules. It is important to note that a dismissal is different than a judgment in the sense of a dismissal is often done without prejudice, but a judgment is final. It's 
something that can't be changed except for an appeal. And with dismissals, we're going to focus on the sufficiency of the facts and the legal allegations. And that, once again, just goes back to the pleadings. Okay, so let's talk about judgment. As mentioned previously, there's three different types of judgments. They all have the same standard. There's a default judgment, there's summary judgment, and then there's judgment as a matter of law slash uh, judgment notwithstanding the verdict, and that's going to be JMAL or JNLV, depending on uh, the timing there. But default judgment is going to be outlined in Rule 55. If a party fails to respond to the complaint, so plaintiff files suit, defendant doesn't respond, within the proper time, that means 21 days in federal court, often 20 days in state court, a default judgment is going to be rendered against that party who fails to respond. A party may choose to default for three reasons. First is if they are judgment proof, uh, they have no collectible assets, so it's like, ha, come and get me if you can, and you can't. So that's going to be the first reason. The second reason is they don't know what a default judgment means. Uh, they don't have any counsel, and as a result, they just get a default and they don't fight it. And the third is because there was improper service, and then the defendant is unaware of the lawsuit. So you may have the default judgment, but then later on you'll have the opportunity to have a hearing to get rid of this default judgment. So we have a case here. It's Virgin Records America versus Lacey. Virgin Records America sued Lacey. Uh, pretty much Lacey had downloaded some music onto a CD, uh, and uh, Virgin Records is suing her, saying, no, that's copyright infringement. You can't do that, and we're going to collect damages against you. Well, Virgin Records goes ahead and sues, and Lacey fails to respond within the 20 days, or, or the 21 days. I can't remember which jurisdiction this was in. But because Lacey failed to respond, she became in default. Notice that this is only default. Uh, the defendant automatically accepts when they become in default all the allegations of the complaint as true. So everything that Virgin Records said in the complaint, regardless of whether or not it was true, when you respond in the answer, typically you accept, you deny, and you, you deny for lack of knowledge. Those are going to be your options. But if you default, all of those allegations are automatically deemed true, which is not good uh, for a defendant. So note that there is that difference between the default and the default judgment. A default is a person that has not responded and they can be in default without having judgment ruled against them. So at the point of default, a judge as the gatekeeping person needs to decide whether or not they're going to enter a default judgment. And so here's the procedure. We've kind of pretty much gone through it, but I want to sum it up in four quick, well, five quick steps and how that'll all work. So first, the defendant is sued and they don't respond within the prescribed time, whether 20 or 21 days. Second, the plaintiff is going to make a motion for a default judgment, saying they didn't show up. Third, the clerk enters a clerk's entry of default. And so that's going to be, you are in default, no default judgment against you yet, but default. Fourth is that there's going to be a judgment hearing. And so this is going to be when the judge determines if judgment is necessary. I mean, in the case of Lacey, Lacey didn't show up to this meeting either, in this hearing. And in this hearing, there's three things that are considered. Uh, they're going to figure out whether or not the defendant was properly served. If they're not served, no judgment is necessary. They're going to make sure that the plaintiff actually established a proper claim in the complaint. So they're going to do a Rule 12b-6 analysis just to make sure that the complaint can't be dismissed. And then third, they're going to look at any possible remedies that are available to the plaintiff. In this case, the plaintiff uh, did the least amount of damages possible against Lacey, so the calculation was easy. They didn't have to have a separate hearing for damages, but if the calculation is difficult, they may have a separate hearing for damages. So then our final step is that if judgment is deemed necessary by the judge, there's going to be a default judgment entered against the defendant. Rule 60 outlines how a defendant may actually get relief from a judgment or an order of judgment. I'll just go ahead and quote it. Uh, it says, a person may show, one, 
mistake, inadvertent, surprise, or excusable neglect. Two, newly discovered evidence that with reasonable diligence could not have been discovered in time. Uh, to move for a new trial. Sorry, there was not a correct there in the text when I had copied it down. Third is fraud, whether that's previously called intrinsic or extrinsic evidence. That's a hard thing to do. And that's not uh, reading that, but that's a hard thing to do is to determine whether or not there's fraud. Uh, the judgment is void. The judgment has been satisfied, released, or discharged. It is... Uh, additionally, if it's based on an earlier judgment that has been reversed or vacated, or applying prospectively to no, it is no longer equitable, meaning it's not fair to have the judgment anymore. It's excused because people messed up. And then six is any other reason that justifies relief. So that's default judgment. No, if you have judgment against you, you lose. So summary judgment, same standard. If a judgment is against you, you lose. But this is rule 56. Summary judgment happens directly before trial. So you've gone through all the pleading stage. You've uh, done uh, discovery. And the defendant says, you know what? You don't have enough evidence to prove your claim. And because you don't have enough evidence to prove your claim, I'm going to file a motion for summary judgment. And that this case should not go to trial. So the idea of summary judgment is a plaintiff who fails to prove their claim, meaning they didn't meet the essential elements, their case should not be heard before a trial because that takes up judicial resources, time, and money. And that's something that the courts don't want to do, especially if it's resolved by law rather than by a finder of fact. So summary judgment is going to come in one of two forms. There's a full summary judgment or there's partial summary judgment. A full summary judgment is all your claims are uh, have a judgment against them. And a partial summary judgment is some of your claims fell. Other cases can go to the jury. So Rule 56A uh, says the court shall grant summary judgment if the movement shows that there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact and that the movement entitled to judgment as a matter of law. That's going to be our rule right there, especially that no genuine dispute as to any material fact. That's going to be our standard to focus on. Rule 56B talks about how long you have to file a motion, or rather the timing of a summary judgment. And it says, unless a different time is set by a local rule or the court orders otherwise, a party may file a motion for summary judgment at any time until 30 days after the close of all discovery. So usually there's a trial date set, there's an end of discovery set, so you have 30 days until after the end of discovery to file a motion for summary judgment. And then Rule 56C is just gonna do all the procedures and the standards that are done by the judge. Uh, that also outlines the standard of the evidence to actually make a past summary judgment. That's gonna be your more likely than not, or the preponderance of the evidence, and that you, your evidence actually shows the claim. And so that leads us into our cases for summary judgment. And we have, I think, three. Nope, we've got four. Uh, our first case is Celotex Corp versus Cataract. Uh, second case is Houchins. Uh, third case is Bias. And fourth case is Tolan. So seal attacks, I won't get into the facts of any of this case. I might get into it with bias just to illustrate it better. But seal attacks uh, is really the first case, uh, the standard case of how to know what the standard for summary judgment is. Uh, it engages in a burden shifting approach, I believe. Uh, first, the defendant needs to show that there is not enough evidence to meet uh, summary well to actually have this case heard by a jury and then second once the plaintiff uh, once the defendant shows that there's a lack of evidence the plaintiff needs to rebut that lack of evidence by pointing out specifically where the evidence is sufficient uh, the plaintiffs in this case do not need to depose their witness they just need to say hey evidence is here uh, we're not going to be required to 
give you our game plan before we go to trial, but here's an affidavit from this witness that says um, there was uh, this injurious pr product in this area, and that's enough to make it a trial. So that's really our standard uh, in Houchins. Okay, I will get into the fact behind this one. This one's pretty fun. Uh, Houchins, uh, a husband had ended up going on a trip, a business trip, and he disappeared. Uh, nobody could find him. And so according to uh, the jurisdiction that he was in, when a person disappears, they are deemed dead uh, after seven years. Uh, regardless of whether or not they're still alive. They they could come back, obviously, and uh, that status, we'll, we'll say status, that status could be revoked, um, but in this jurisdiction, after seven years of not no sightings, hearings, after diligently trying to find the person, uh, the person is deemed dead. Now, importantly, the statute doesn't say how they were deemed dead, whether it was on purpose or an accident. So Houchins, in this case, this wife had two health insurance policies, and these health insurance policies said that the person had to die on accident. But here, the person disappeared. And so even though he was deemed dead, there was no way of knowing whether he had died by accident or on purpose. So the key issue in this case is uh, that the life insurance only covered the accidental deaths. And because of the circumstances, it, it was impossible to know how he died because there were no witnesses. So for Mrs. Houchins to win, she needs to prove enough evidence that a reasonable jury, based on this evidence, preponderance of the evidence, that he died by accident. And here the evidence was insufficient for any determination that he died by accident. So the company is going to win. And the reason why this can't go to the jury is because there are no essential facts for the jury to make any judgments on. Now, let's play around with a couple hypotheticals on this situation just, just to see. Say, for example, Mrs. Houchins has a friend uh, who was in the country at the same time Mr. Houchins was in the country. And he goes on and he says, you know what, I saw Mr. Houchins get hit by a bus. Uh, crude, but that's... That's what happened. It doesn't matter that she is or he is Mrs. Houchin's friend. His evidence would be there to show, hey, this could go to a jury because there is a dispute about a genuine issue of fact. Say a hundred people are there. And so this is hypothetical too. Say a hundred people that knows Mrs. Houchin's goes to of the same country and says I saw Mr. Houchin shot and then the one person goes over there and says I saw Mr. Houchin hit by a bus on accident now this is still going to go to the jury even though the large weight of the evidence is going to point in favor of the other uh, of the life insurance policies uh, of the life insurance company there is still a genuine dispute of a material fact here because one person says, I saw him die by accident. Now, it is important to note one last hypothetical is that if the statute said after seven years, the person has not been found or heard from, is deemed to have been dead, is deemed to have died by accident, well, then that gives the assumption that he did die by accident. And in that case, summary judgment is fit, but it's fit instead to go in favor of Mrs. Houchins because uh, the life insurance policy at that point would have to show that he died on purpose, not on accident, because that there is that presumption of accident in that situation. So there's just a couple of hypotheticals to go off with there. Our next case is Bias versus Advantage International, Inc. And this was, a, uh, this was a really, you could say, tragic situation where Bias was a rising college star. He was drafted first to go to the Celtics, and he died two 
two days after his draft pick to go to the Celtics uh, from a drug overdose. And uh, the estate of Bias, his parents, are suing the agency who Bias worked with and for two reasons. First, they're saying uh, that they didn't work hard enough with insurance companies to get him a life insurance policy. And two, they're saying that they didn't work hard enough with a shoe sponsorship to get him that sponsorship. In this episode, we're only going to talk about the and the life insurance policy, um, which would have been about a million dollars. So Advantage says that the life insurance policy would never have happened. And, and as a result, there's no genuine issue that a life insurance policy could have happened. And so this ultimately comes, and the reason for that is because the life insurance policies, every single one of them is going to ask, have you ever done drugs? And so this situation where he died by a drug overdose is relevant to the fact that he did drugs, but it ultimately comes down to, did he take drugs prior to his actual death? That's going to be, is there a genuine issue that he did drugs before he died? And so the evidence that was presented by the estate of Bias, that Bias was not a drug user, is that one, his parents never saw him use drugs. Second, his coach never saw him use drugs. And third, a random drug test came back clean, uh, showing that he didn't use drugs. But there was evidence presented by Advantage that Bias was a previous drug user. And this was testimony that came from two of his teammates who saw him use drugs at a party. Now, this seems like conflicting evidence, right? This seems like evidence that would go to a jury and ultimately would determine, did he do drugs, and if so, or if not, then the parents would be entitled to this uh, life insurance policy. Well, why is there a summary judgment granted in this case? And it's because the estate's witnesses, the parents, the coach, and the drug test, did not contradict the testimony that was provided by Advantage specifically that he did drugs at this party. So Advantage presented evidence he did drugs at this party. The parents weren't at that party. The coach was not at that party. And the random drug test wasn't taken around the time that the party had happened. So what did the parents need to do in this case? Well, they needed to first depose the witnesses who had attended the party and said that he did drugs and they need to get them to contradict their testimony. I say, I was with him at this time, he did not do drugs then, and have the other person say, I was with him at that time and he did drugs. So the estate needs to get them to contradict their testimony or they need to depose other witnesses that were at the party to actually say, yes, he did drugs at that place and at that time. Or no, he didn't do drugs at that place and at that time. Excuse me, I got that backwards. So even though it appears that the evidence was contradictory, it's not because the estate's evidence failed to even attempt to contradict the teammate's evidence that he did drugs at the party. Our final case, as far as summary judgment goes, is Tolan versus Cotton. This was an Aggressive police stop. Uh, police had put in the wrong plate. A uh, number it was one digit off, and just so happened that the plate number that they ran up was a stolen plate, and this one was not a stolen car. Ended up driving into the driveway. Uh, incidents happened, and the police ended up uh, shooting the young man in the driveway. And so summary judgment was initially granted in trial and in the Fifth Circuit because of the qualified immunity, which it's really hard to sue a governmental agency. Even though it's really hard to sue a governmental agency, there are still tribal issues because it was what was the lighting like? What were the actions of the mother that caused the shooting? What were the actions of the son that caused the shooting? And so summary judgment in this case was not merited. So it's really hard to prove qualified immunity, but a high standard does not increase the standard of summary judgment and that's our big takeaway from that case 
So that's summary judgment. Let's go ahead and just sum everything up uh, with a sentence or two. Uh, this episode has been all about resolution without trial. There are three main ways to do that. You can have settlement, dismissals, and judgment. Both the plaintiff and the defendant can have dismissal either be through Rule 12 for the defendant or Rule 41 for the plaintiff. And finally, judgment comes in three forms. You have judgment as a matter of law. You have summary judgment, the two that we focused in this episode. And finally, we have Rule 50, judgment as a matter of law. I think I messed that up. I'm going to say that part just again. Rule 55, default judgment. Rule 56, summary judgment. And Rule 50, judgment as a matter of law or judgment notwithstanding the verdict. So that's resolution without trial. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro. And you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited. The only ones that aren't are pre-law materials. And the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice. And with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.